In 1802, on April 4th in Hampton, Maine, Dorothea Dix was born. Mistreated from an early age, Dorothea learned how important it was to have a supportive home and upbringing. During the War of 1812, Dorothea and her family fled to Vermont to avoid British occupation. Shortly after the war, Dorothea left her home in Vermont to start a long and prosperous teaching career in Boston. Opening numerous girls' schools around the Boston area, she became a respected member of the community. Nearing the end of her teaching career, Dorothea grew sick, and in 1830, she was forced to lessen her teachings. By 1836, her health had worsened. She was diagnosed with tuberculosis and forced to end her career as a teacher. Later in the year, she left for England in hopes her health would be restored. While in England, Dorothea learned that she had inherited a great sum of money. Health restored, she returned to the U.S. in 1841. This was the start of Dorothea's new and important career for which she would be remembered by for centuries. Back in Massachusetts, Dorothea was invited to work at the East Cambridge House of Corrections to teach Sunday school to the prisoners. After working here for a short time, she quickly realized that the institution was not what it seemed to be. Perhaps one of the least severe examples of the unspeakable atrocities found in the institution was that of prisoners being left in the darkness for hours on end without supervision. This prompted Dorothea to determine whether the same horrors were found in other institutions around the state of Massachusetts. After her two-year search throughout the state of Massachusetts, Dorothea decided to present her findings to the Massachusetts State Legislature in the form of a report. After much consideration, the Massachusetts State Legislature passed a bill that would give institutions throughout the state sufficient land for the storing of the prison's inhabitants. For the next five years, Dorothea traveled throughout the outlying states, advocating on the behalf of those who could not. New York and New Jersey were two of the first states to accept Dorothea's ideas on prison reform. In 1845, she made known her ideas by publishing a book entitled Remarks on Prisons and Prison Discipline in the U.S. Just three years later, in 1848, Dorothea took her ideas for prison reform and presented them to the U.S. government in the form of a bill. In this bill, her cause was stated and she petitioned that five million acres of land be set aside for the mentally ill. For six years, Dorothea's propositions lay stagnant. It wasn't until 1854, when both houses of Congress passed their ideas on to the president, that her dreams started to fade. President Franklin Pierce was not particularly moved by her cause, and decided later that year to veto the petition. After the government's failure to pass the bill, Dorothea grew sick, and again she decided to go to Europe to try and recover. For the next two years, Dorothea greatly affected the prison reform in Europe. She had a meeting with Pope Pius IX and presented the same ideas to him that she had presented to the U.S. government. Dorothea returned to the U.S. in 1856 to continue her career in helping the mentally ill. In the next 25 years of her life, Dorothea went on to do many things that would only increase her fame and respectability, including becoming the superintendent of army nurses during the Civil War. After working so tirelessly for nearly 70 years, the stress of leading such a hard-working life caught up to her, and eventually, in 1881, she grew too sick to continue and was confined to her bedroom. She remained an invalid in her own hospital in Trenton, New Jersey, until her death in 1887. Throughout her life, Dorothea built 32 institutions in 15 different states, made known the atrocious happenings in the early U.S. prisons, was a pioneer in the women's rights movement, and effectively convinced the world that the way the insane were treated was inhumane. Although there are arguments that Dorothea was just another radical thinker that was brainwashed by her Calvinistic upbringing during the Second Great Awakening, when we look at her life, we can't help but realize how great, unselfish, and unique a woman she was.